So yes, I'm Chamit, and uh, Lakmal and both uh, Amila both uh, described in detail about uh, the best practices of operations and the availability aspects and uh, what to do and what not to do and kind of stuff. So I'll be talking about uh, more uh, disciplinary aspects of automation and orchestration and. Uh, try to focus more on uh, continuous integration and continuous delivery. So uh, before moving into uh, the next slide, uh, do we have any folks who are directly involved with operations here? Any DevOps persons or any sysadmins or any type of operations guys? Okay. So the best way to know, note them is uh, they are the ones who are in jeans and with open shoelaces. And some people say they make weird noises, but that's a myth, it's not proven yet. So uh, today's agenda is, uh, I will give the definition of automation and orchestration, and uh, we will talk about uh, the benefits you can gain from end-to-end -end automation, and uh, I will give uh, I, uh, an example of uh, a typical CI/CD process, and uh, then uh, some orchestration and automation tools, and uh, another real-world example for orchestration, and then uh, I will talk briefly about uh, uh, WSO2's managed cloud offering. So what is automation? It's the accomplishment of a task or a function without human intervention. It's simple. So everyone knows it. So when automating something, how do you figure out what sort of task? You must be having like lots of tasks. Like if you list down it, you can like end up with a lengthy list of tasks you do day to day, in like day to day, you carry out day to day. So how do you pick a uh, task that you need to automate? How do, you, how, how do you pick on them? How do you select what to automate and what to automate and what, just, what to just leave? So how, do you, how would you figure that out? So basically, we do automate to make things easy for us as humans and to make our setups, our work, our life more robust. So the best answer would be for that uh, is the things you do repeatedly, very frequently, are the tasks that you should focus more and consider automating. Let's look at what orchestration means. Orchestration means arranging and coordination of automated tasks. So you cannot have orchestration uh, without automation. So we, those two goes together. And ultimately resulting in a consolidated process, processes of workflow. So orchestration means now that you have automated a bunch of tasks, you combine those together and create a workflow or a process and manage it. That is orchestration. That is what happens in a real orchestra. So the person who orchestrates, he knows uh, what each and every component do, the, op the duty and the role of each and every component, and he simply controls the orchestra. So that is it's the, basically the same thing in the DevOps context. So if I talk about the advantages, the very first thing would be visibility. Visibility means when you have automation and orchestration, uh, you, need to, you need to know. So when you have orchestration, you, now that you have like a whole bunch of tasks you are managing from a single point, you need to know what's going on at, at each level. What are the things that are doing good? What are the things that are doing not so good? What are the things that are broken? So the, it, uh, with orchestration, you will get the clear visibility at different levels to a single point, so that you can take your decisions upon those statistics, and you can become single-minded. And with automation and orchestration, you need to, you can like deliver changes from the uh, from the developer's machine to the production system within a very small amount of time. So you get that advantage as well. Without that, 
it would be a disaster to figure out what changes do I put to production. Or you cannot do it case by case when you are in a, like a very highly changing, highly evolving environment. Changes, you, the requests you are getting from your peers to push to production would be huge. And you have to have a controlled mechanism and control steps in place to figure out like uh, uh, how good they are and how scalable they are, how well tested they are, and then uh, push those changes to production. And you need to do it fast. If I give you an example, uh, Amazon pushes changes to their production servers once every 11.6 seconds every day. So those changes are directly coming from their source code management system. They are getting built. They, once, once they get build the source code, they are getting tested automatically, and straight away uh, they push it to production. So that whole process is automated, and only with orchestration uh, they could achieve that. And then you have the governance. Governance means like when you are in a big enterprise, you cannot rely on. I'm, I'm talking in the context of operations and DevOps. So there you cannot depend on having multiple silos of data. You need to combine all, all together and have a single place for all the data. So that you can, that would give you the power to enforce best practices, policies, and then make it a standard, make standards across the organization rather than having different standards and different policies for different segments of the organization. So you have governance, so you can establish it at one place and repeat it across the platform or across the enterprise. And then you have the flexibility. So when you're talking about flexibility and DevOps, the key aspect is integration. So it doesn't matter whether you automate things or you are using orchestration, your tools need to integrate together. So output of one tool should be an input to the other. All the tools should be able to talk together and then generate results uh, and statistics. And each tool has to trigger events so that you, have, you can know uh, every little bit of details uh, throughout your pipeline. So you can analyze those and uh, prevent bad things from happening or do improvements uh, for the platform or for your pipeline. And then it has to be uh, extensible. Only with orchestration and automation, you can scale or extend your uh, setups. Uh, and it's very advisable to adopt these practices at the very early stages of the business. So that from, the, from day one, you are designing your plan to scale and extend your things uh, into greater heights. And you start things small and then slowly build up until you come to a uh, sustainable and a stable position. So this is a typical CI CD workflow. And uh, your code is developed uh, at one environment. It could be in workstations or in the developer environment. And then the, the human, humans who are really writing the code uh, commit their code into their source code management system. It could be anything. There are lots of technologies for uh, cater that facility. And then uh, on nightly basis or periodically, that code gets pushed, uh, pulled out of the CM and build it and run integration tests and various others, other types of tests behind the screen. And then once the build is success and the integration tests are passed. So these are all policy-driven things. So you can have a policy saying uh, if the integration test success uh, rate of the integration test is above 95%, uh, process, uh, like, uh, for, move to the other stage. That is, uh, deploy the changes to the staging environment. There you can run uh, UAT tests. You can run stress tests and uh, simulate use activities and make sure your changes or your code doesn't break anything existing. And once again, based on policies and rules, if the success rate is beyond a certain level, you push the change, you pick those changes, and send it to production. So, and then once that is in production, you again monitor things, like Amil explained. You have to monitor, and monitoring 
only alo monitoring alone gives you a massive ability to become, be robust and fail-proof. And whenever you detect things from monitoring, you again, it uh, generates a feedback loop and fix those things, and then the fixes go through the same cycle. So uh, there are well-known open source tools out there to facilitate uh, the automation and the orchestration part of this whole cycle. So talking about some of them tools, uh, for automation, you can use Puppet and Chef, Ansible, CF Engine. Do we have anyone who, who are using these technologies already? Anyone who's familiar with or using these technologies in-house? OK. So and M Collective is, again, uh, an orchestration tool provided by Puppet Labs. So with that, you can, no matter how many number of servers you have in the deployment, it could be 100, it could be uh, thousands of servers. Uh, the benchmark they have done is uh, for 3,500 servers for a single M Collective server. Uh, from a single point, from a single uh, terminal, it could be your work session as well, you can control all the all 1,000 servers from that point. You don't, have to do, you don't actually have to remember the IP addresses or the host name of your end servers. You don't know where they are running, but you still can do remote operations across those. With M Collective, you can select portions of the deployment. You can select the subset of a deployment and say, apply these changes only to this set of servers, not and leave everything else as it is. Likewise, it is very easy to deploy this. Uh, it takes less than one hour to set up M Collective across 100 servers. Um, that is only if you have automation. And again, uh, if you are using AWS, uh, CloudFormation, and OpsWork, those two works together. OpsWork is, again, Chef-based uh, automation framework that AWS provides. And CloudFormation is their infrastructure orchestration platform. And again, if you are a Python geek, you can use Salt from SoulStack. So uh, WSO2 is uh, using Puppet internally for all automation work. And we have created Puppet modules for all WSO2, uh, for all WSO2 servers. And uh, those modules are available at this location. So you can download the product from the website and get the Puppet module, um, uh, put them together, and deploy that within a fraction of a second in any uh, Linux-based environment you have. So, uh, and those Puppet modules are production-ready modules. Uh, the data and the logic is uh, separated out, and the data is abstracted to uh, Hira. If you know Hira, that's, uh, that's the tool that Puppet Labs pro uh, provides to create hierarchical data structures. And using that, you can use the same Puppet modules with different data in multiple environments. So you still have the same logic, so same deployment logic, same automation logic, but based on the data you are providing in Hira, that gets act differently. That is what Amil explained. The same product has different profiles and different roles in the same deployment. So that is also provided along with these modules. So this is another real world example uh, for orchestration. So here we have, uh, here we have the users. And uh, this is a classical uh, scenario of uh, some people, some developers in an organization, they uh, write code in a cloud-based IDE. They commit their code into a source code management system. So here, I, these, these tools are just examples to explain the story. And uh, Eclipse J is the cloud IDE. And from there, you commit your code to either a CN server or a Git server. And then there are build servers that are taking this change. Those could be Jenkins or Bamboo or anything. And then once you are, you are dip, uh, build, once the build is successful, you then deploy your changes into any pass out there. It could be Kubernetes or OpenStack or Apache Stratos, AWS, it could be anything. You just deploy your servers, uh, deploy your artifact, build artifact into any of those environments. And you use Redmine or Atlassian Jira uh, for issue tracking. And then again, it comes to the users and the development. Uh, and the tool, so these, are, these tools can 
perform uh, alone by themselves, but uh, the orchestrator is the person who is sitting in the middle and do all like combine all these tools together and create the story for the end user. So users come to the orchestrator and the orchestrator they come to the orchestrator and say I want to write code and then the orchestrator forwards them to the Che. And once the code is written, they come back to the orchestrator and the orchestrator then knows that the user is done with writing code and it commits the code into uh, the source code management system. And then based on again uh, some given policies, the orchestrator can trigger builds and then the orchestrator can again deploy changes. So the key aspect here is the monitoring. So every opera operation that orchestrator does, it knows the statistics about it, whether this particular operation ran successfully or not, or if it breaks on the halfway where it got broken, what happened to it, and gives feedback continuously to the user. <coughs> Sorry. And when the build is successful, only the orchestrator pushes the changes to the desired environment. And then the orchestrator again takes care of the issue tracking system also. There are some, the, the, the orchestrator picks only the changes from resolved tickets and then uh, take it through the cycle, likewise. So uh, if you go to uh, WSO2's uh, public cloud, in the app cloud, we have, the whole, we have this whole story created there. And you can actually create an account, become a user of the WSO2 cloud, uh, write your code in the cloud-based IDE, and uh, uh, we use Git as the SCM, and we use Jenkins as the build server, and we use Apache Stratos right now uh, to uh, deploy your changes or deploy your code, and we use Redmine uh, uh, as the uh, issue tracking system, and uh, it is again provided with uh, the setup. So you can try this out uh, if you create an account in the app cloud and uh, write a few lines of code. So uh, as a managed service, what we do is we create this whole bunch of things I spoke about and provide this service, DevOps service, uh, provide DevOps basically as a service to end users. So there what we do is uh, when people, when we come up with a solution, this, when, when the solution architects come up with a solution together with the client requirements, we take that solution, we do the deployment, <coughs> excuse me, and we do the deployment and we manage it. We make sure that we push latest changes to the cl uh, cloud and update your setup uh, continuously, and we make sure that the changes goes through the development and testing and staging and production lifecycle, and we make sure that your uh, production setups are properly monitored and uh, regular backups are taken, and uh, disaster recovery drills are performed, we cover the whole story for you. So that is what we do with this managed cloud. And finally, uh, the SLA guarantee for uptime for availability is 499 99.99 guarantee. <laughs>